Open your Bible, please, to Matthew chapter 13. I want to read verse, verses 31 and 32. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. When it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now when we come to the third parable, many students are confronted with a serious problem. Parables 1 and 2 were interpreted by the Lord. No student could miss the interpretation of the parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils, and the wheat and the tares. Christ made that very clear. When you come to parable number 3, he does not interpret this one. He offers no explanation. He merely gives the parable, and we are left at that point. But we should not become discouraged as students of the Word of God. First of all, every born-again person has a built-in Bible teacher. Our Lord promised in John 14, verse 26, and John 16, verse 13, that He would send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who would not only teach us all things, but show us things to come. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 9, And as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. As someone will say, but here is a believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit, or here are two believers indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and they have different viewpoints on this parable. All right, let's uh, take a principle of biblical interpretation then. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. The Apostle Paul speaks of comparing spiritual things with spirit. When you come to a portion of scripture like this where the interpretation is not clearly stated as it is in parables 1 and 2, then we have to go to the principles, the hermeneutic principles, the basic principles of biblical interpretation. Now, the Bible, in some respects, is like the human body. It is composed of different members, yet it is a unit. Each member has a separate function, but each is necessary to the completion of the whole. We have to come to the Bible in that fashion. It's like fitting the pieces of a puzzle together. For example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 throws light on Revelation 13 and vice versa. Daniel chapters 9 and 11 throw light on Matthew 24 and vice versa. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 will throw light on Matthew 13 and vice versa. There are parallel teachings in the Bible comparing spiritual things with spirit. Now before we look to the Word for an understanding of this parable, let me submit to you a peril that had been mentioned frequently by the late Dr. G. Camel Morgan. Dr. Morgan in his teaching said on a number of occasions, beware of the peril of popularity. By that he meant beware of the peril of being influenced by the general consensus of biblical exposition. Majority are not always right. In 1882, Dr. A.B. Bruce wrote a book entitled The Parabolic Teaching of Christ. I have gone through that book on two occasions. In it, Dr. Bruce makes this statement. He said, the parable of the mustard seed is a good omen of the future in which Jesus foreshadowed the spread of Christianity. Now, many of Dr. Bruce's students imbibed his teaching. And that became the popular opinion of the parable of the mustard seed. But I like what Dr. Morgan says here. Beware of the peril of popular opinion. The majority are not always right. Now remember that there is harmony in the teaching of these seven parables. They form a connected and a completed whole. Any interpretation of one that contradicts others cannot be correct. So I submit to you in my judgment, the popular interpretation of this parable is incorrect. First of all, there is an unnatural and an unhealthy development. A mustard seed does not grow into a healthy tree. Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, please. Page 1 in your Bible. I'm reading from verse 11. 
God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. The herb reproduced after its kind. The tree reproduced after its kind. I say a mustard seed does not grow into a healthy tree. An herb developing into a healthy tree is unknown. If you have an herb developing into a healthy tree, you have a monstrosity. You have a freak. So the popular opinion is not the correct one in my judgment. Now briefly, let's review parables one and two. In the first parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils, there were four types of soil on which the seed was sown. Seventy-five percent of the soil did not respond favorably to the seed, which was the Word of God. Now which is the larger number, the rejectors or those who received the truth, or those who rejected the truth? This then is not Christianity. This is Christendom, a false greatness. In the second parable, you have the tares growing with the wheat, the children of the devil side by side with the children of God or the children of the kingdom. And it's in the area of religion where you see this greatness. On Thursday, I was in the bookstore autographing books. And a large man, well built, came and stood beside me for a while in silence. Then after a while he said, may I speak to you? I said, you may. He said, where can we go? I said, I can't go any place. I'm obligated to be here. Why don't you talk right here? And he began to tell me something about his background, his ancestry. Then he began to quote scripture. He quoted 12 verses, word perfect from the book of Ecclesiastes. He quoted nine verses word perfect from the book of Jeremiah. And as he was quoting scripture, I could see it was not making sense. He was quoting it, but it wasn't fitting in. It didn't make sense. He was not comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Then finally I said, may I ask who you are? He said, I am Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he was in dead earnest, and he was no kook. He was an intelligent man. He had memorized scripture. I said, will you please show me your hands? He extended his hands. I said, sir, you are an imposter. Jesus Christ of Nazareth has scars in his hands. You have none. I'm sorry I have no more time to spend with you. Of course, by that time, a crowd had gathered around and was listening to this conversation. You see, in these days, there will be false Christs. In the area of religion, there will be unusual growth. Now, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to go back to the book of Daniel. Will you turn, please, to Daniel chapter 4? Daniel chapter 4. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. One of the dreams that Daniel had, and I'll have to be brief in coming to the uh, interpretation or the explanation of the dream. In verse 10 of Daniel 4, thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Note the ecumenicity of this tree, its greatness, its far-reaching influence into the end of the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof. Now, we're comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Here's a mustard seed, develops into a great tree. You see the ecumenicity of it. 
the birds of the air were lodging in the branches of that mustard seed that grew into a tree. Verse 22, Daniel said, It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. There you see growth and greatness and ecumenicity. Now if you will turn to the um, second chapter of the book of Daniel, we have another dream interpreted by Daniel. Verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold. Now there were four medals representing four Gentile world powers. To conserve time, let's move to verse 38, where Daniel said, Thou art this head of gold. Ah, said Nebuchadnezzar, I'm the head of gold, meaning that I shall be dethroned. Another nation will take over, I'll settle that. So verse 1 of chapter 3, he makes an image of gold from head to foot. And then when the image is completed, he sends word out through the empire that at the sound of the musical instruments, everyone in his empire, verse 5, should fall down and worship the golden image. Verse 6, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Verse 7, they worship the golden image. Verse 10, they worship the golden image. Verse 11, they were worshiping the golden image. The chapter is loaded with worship. Get the religious flavor of this huge tree and this great image. It reaches out to the inhabited earth and it all has to do with religion. Now when you come back to the parables, you find the birds and the branches of this great mustard tree. Now what are these birds? What do they represent? Well, in context, in context, keeping the seven parables together now, the birds represent the wicked one. You remember in the parable, Matthew 13, 4, when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up. When our Lord interprets that portion, he said the fowls in verse 19 represent the wicked one. They are evil. Here then in the mustard seed, which grows into a huge monstrosity, a freak, a great tree, an abnormal growth, there are buzzards in the branches. In the context, the birds represent evil, not good. Now, birds do not always represent evil in Scripture. You will remember in Matthew chapter 3, when our Lord was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. But the context will interpret it for us. In the context of the parables, you have buzzards in the branches, and the birds in the parables represent evil. Is this Christianity permeating the earth, saving the world? bringing in the kingdom? Of course not. There's harmony, there's continuity, there's consistency in the seven parables. So much for the parable of the mustard seed. Let's move now to the parable of the leaven. Verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Now, I believe in my judgment that this is possibly one of the most controversial verses in the entire Bible. I do not know of a single verse in the Bible around which there has been so much controversy and difference of opinion. There are two major interpretations to this parable. Number one, the leaven is a symbol of good. It is the gospel permeating society. The other interpretation is that the leaven is a recognized principle of evil. Now that the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching in these parables prophetic truth concerning the course and the character of the age, the present age in which we are living, during his absence between his two advents, his first coming and his second coming, 
Then we are to see the prophetic aspect as we move along in the seven. Back in the year of, um, well, I'm not sure of the year. I'm sure it was a hundred years ago, as I go back into my history, a man by the name of Dean Henry Alford said concerning this parable, and I quote, the parable of the leaven is the gospel penetrating all humanity by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this man was a Christian. He loved the Lord. I believe he loved the word of the Lord, but he was a man. And men at their best are but men at best. All men have feet of clay. Now I say this with all due respect to this great man of God. My dear people, in his exposition of the parable, he did not have one verse of scripture to support the view that the parable of the leaven represents good, that it is the gospel permeating all society by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me say this. If leaven is the gospel, then the fourth parable is out of harmony with the others. If leaven is the gospel, then it is failing and not succeeding. If leaven is the gospel, the world should be converted by now. Is leaven the gospel? permeating all society? How could it be if only 25% respond favorably in the first parable? How can it be the gospel permeating all society by the power of the Holy Spirit as long as the tares are growing up? And I'm wondering whether there are not more tares than wheat. Our Lord referred to his own as the little flock. As I stated earlier in this series, we are in the overwhelming minority of truly born-again people. We are not passing judgment on individuals, but go out and see the mass of society. Does it look as though leaven is the gospel permeating all society and bringing people in subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ? Not at all. The incorrect view in my judgment, leans toward universalism. And no Christian will accept that. Let's look at the leaven for a few moments. First, leaven in the Old Testament. Let us compare spiritual things with spiritual. Let us lay aside the popular opinion of expository uh, uh, teaching on the, on the parable. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 19. For some years I have enjoyed... Uh, looking for principles of biblical interpretation. And one of them is what has been referred to as the law of first mention. Now, this is not hard and fast, and I'm not going to be dogmatic about this. But very often, if you want to know the meaning of something, you go to the Bible and find out where it appears for the first time. Where it appears for the first time. And study that in context, and very often you will get the meaning or the significance of that term. For example, the word worship. The first time it appears in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham said, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and return again. If you will study the context of that chapter, you'll learn a lot about worship. Now the word leaven appears, and to the best of my knowledge, if I've overlooked an appearance, I'll have to apologize, but to the best of my knowledge, this is the first mention of leaven in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 19. There came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now we are not told why he baked unleavened bread, but is it not significant that the Holy Spirit would mention that it was omitted? Why, we are not told here, but in the first mention, it does not have a favorable flavor 
as far as I can see. That's the first mention. Will you please note the first mention is associated with Sodom, a city of wickedness. Now turn to the book of Exodus chapter 12, please. The book of Exodus chapter 12. When you found the 12th chapter, I would like to read verse 15. Verse 8 first. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. I'm not told why, except the Spirit of God makes certain that it's mentioned that the leaven was to be omitted. Verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Verse 17, you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. Verse 18, in the first month on the 14th day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread. Verse 19, seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. Now that's associated with Egypt. Here are two wicked cities, both of which oppose the truth of God. Now turn in the, your Bible to the last book in the Bible, the book of the Revelation, and find chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Here we have the story of the two witnesses during the tribulation. Somebody suggested that Dr. McGee will probably never die. He'll be one of the two witnesses. I don't know whether that's so or not, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, He's not here to defend himself, but uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Now the two witnesses are killed, and we read that their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually, they were wicked cities, and they represented evil. And in the two portions of Scripture where Levin is first mentioned, it's associated with those two cities of evil. So you have leaven in the Old Testament. Now if you go on through, read Exodus chapter 34, Leviticus chapter 2. The leaven was excluded from the blood offerings. The leaven was excluded from the meal offerings. Why? 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Open your Bible and listen to the Apostle Paul as he throws some light upon those Old Testament passages. He says in verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The blood offerings and the meal offerings typified the Lord Jesus. Leaven was to be omitted from them. Turn in your Bible now to the New Testament commentary on leaven. Matthew chapter 16. The 16th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. And when you found that 16th chapter, I would like to read verse 6. Now the Lord Jesus said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, what's the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, turn over to Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, and verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. How can you make it the gospel? It isn't done, it doesn't speak of good in the Old Testament. Our Lord warns to beware of it, the leaven of hypocrisy. The Pharisees were hypocrites. Read Matthew 23 out loud. Some of the strongest denunciations ever to come from the lips of any man came from the lips of the Lord Jesus when he brought those Pharisees down low with his denunciation of their hypocrisy. They were play actors. They were phonies, religious, but lost. Very active in their religious dealings, but they were lost. They were hypocrites. All right, the Pharisees then believed that a man was religious and that he pleased God if he appeared right 
outwardly. The Pharisee could have a heart filled with envy, with lust, with hate, with jealousy, with greed. Yet if he appeared right outwardly, he was pleasing God. Jesus said that is the leaven of the Pharisee's hypocrisy. Then he said, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. In uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, he sounds the warning. Then in verses 11 and 12 of Matthew 16, How is it that ye do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, what was the doctrine of the Sadducees? Chapter 22 of the Gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 22, verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. They didn't believe in life after death. That's what made them sad, you see. They had no hope. They were the existentialists of their day. They believed in materialistic humanism. Life consists of the things that I can see and touch and taste and handle. You live for the present. And you make leaven good. Where in the Bible will you turn to support that teaching? And then in Mark 8, 15, he said, Beware of the leaven of Herod. Well, what was that? Worldliness. Herod lived in adultery with his brother's wife. You go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The inflexible hands of the clock which refuse to stop moving will terminate my deliberations before I'm ready to be terminated but I have no choice. In chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, you have immorality, gross immorality. A man in the church in Corinth, a married man with a grown son, apparently his wife had died, he remarried, possibly a younger woman, and his grown son by his first wife was going to bed with his stepmother. These were in the church in Corinth. And it was in the light of that context that the Lord Jesus said, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So you have then the leaven in the gospel records. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, you have the leaven of legalism. Here were people converted in the province of Galatia. In those churches, they had been Jews. And the Judaistic, legalistic teacher said, you have to go back to the law. You must go back to circumcision, to the Mosaic Code. There you have the leaven of legalism. It is not good. Paul makes that clear in Galatians. It is not good. It has a great influence, but not for good. Now let's come back to the leaven in the parable. And it says there that the woman took and hid meal, three measures of meal. Now, it's the only appearance of the meal in the New Testament, to the best of my knowledge. So we have to go back to the Old Testament. Now, we are told by those who teach that the leaven is the gospel, that the meal is humanity. But the uh, meal in Scripture is good. Is humanity good? There are three Roman nuns in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. There is none righteous, none that doeth good, none that seeketh after God. No, the meal is not humanity. It is not the human race. The first mention of meal is in Genesis chapter 18. Turn, please, to the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis. I would like to read, beginning with verse 1. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door. 
and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the heart. Now, I'm submitting to you, not by way of interpretation, but by way of application, if you please, I'm suggesting to you that here we have the idea of fellowship, communication. Now, in the parable, the woman acts deceitfully by secretly introducing the corrupting influence of leaven into the meal. That fractures the fellowship, my dear people. Any form of evil creeping into the church, the local assembly, or into the religious system cannot do it any good. It fractures the fellowship. And all across our country today, the fellowship is being fractured by new innovations, by new ideas that are contrary to the teaching of Scripture. And oftentimes professing Christians, church-going, Bible-carrying Christians cannot see truth from error, and they fall prey to many aspects and facets of this great religious system, this monstrosity known as Christendom. All right, the history of the church then is a record of a fractured fellowship. Now, the woman is a symbol of religion. There are four women in the book of the Revelation. In chapter 2, there is Jezebel. She represents a religious system, pagan idolatry. In chapter 12, there is the woman clothed with the sun, that I understand to be Israel. In chapters 19 and 21, you have the bride, the church, and again in chapter 17, you have that great ecumenical church. The woman in the Revelation represents religious systems. Here then is a woman representing a system of religion. But what is she doing? She's hiding the meal. Beloved, if the leaven is the gospel, tell me, why hide it? Why hide it? Our Lord said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Shout it from the housetops. You don't hide it. What is our Lord teaching in these parables? He's teaching the course and the character of the age. As the age grows, we'll see this great tree spreading its branches. The tares with the wheat. You'll see the buzzards in the branches. You'll see the great ecumenical movement spreading out to the inhabited earth. What are we waiting for? While we wait, and while we worship, and while we watch, and while we work, we are waiting for him who said, If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy holy word for its inspiration, its inerrancy, its infallibility, its indestructibility. We thank Thee for giving to us Thy Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And we pray that Thou wilt seal the truth that has been given throughout this week by all of these dear brethren to all of our hearts. And may we all add to our spiritual stature as the result of this gathering, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.